Created from what was originally the west part of the municipality of Hinchinbrook, Elgin came into existence on July 26, 1855. Its first mayor was Daniel McFarland Sr. The first town meetings were held in the school across from where the present town hall now stands and its foundations can still be seen in the old graveyard that is there today. Elgin's namesake was Lord Elgin, Canada's Governor General from 1847 to 1854. As a moderate reformer, he encouraged Canada to develop an autonomous government from Britain and promoted responsible governance. On October 5, 1868, following a motion tabled by Councillor Smale and seconded by Councillor McIntosh, a part of W. Thomas McFarland's land was acquired for the amount of $5 on which to build the town hall. Alexander and Robert Johnstone were hired to build the hall for the amount of $1,180.70. Elgin was made up of five subcommunities: Beath, Glen Elm, Kelvin Grove, Kensington, and Kelso, all of which owed their origin to the familiar places and names of Scotland and England from which the first settlers came. Life for the first settlers was far from easy. The land was so covered with trees, hardly any sunshine got through. These elms, oaks, maples, and pines were sometimes three meters or more in diameter and were cut only with axes as saws were not available. The settlers had to work together to help make clearings for houses and small gardens. The piles of felled trees were then burned and the ashes saved to make potash. Barrels of potash weighing 270 kilograms were shipped back to the old country for use as fertilizer. Selling at six to ten dollars a barrel, it provided families with the only reliable source of income for a number of years. Once enough land was cleared, they were able to start raising animals for meat wool, and leather, such as cows, sheep, horses, and pigs. They also grew some wheat and grain, but conditions were not ideal, and because they could often not produce enough to feed the entire family, exchanges of goods were made between families. These early settlers knew the value of sharing. If this had not been the case, many would have starved to death in those early years. Neighbors were always quick to lend a hand. If the head of one household fell sick, they would cut his wood for him. If one died and left a family behind, the neighbors would see to it that they were taken care of. Everyone depended on each other, and this is how Elgin grew, through acts of goodwill and selflessness. The roads, such as they were, were also wet, rough, and very hard to travel. River travel was very common in those days, and so you will see that the front of many houses faced one of the two rivers bordering Elgin. 
Otherwise, they made their trip on foot by trails blazed through the woods. to arrive was an Englishman by the name of James Terry, who built his shanty just east of the Holbrook Bridge at the west end of Elgin on what was more recently the James Gavin Farm. The majority of the first arrivals settled here between the Trout River and Oak Creek. Some of these families and names are still heard today either as descendants who still live in Elgin or as names that grace some of our roads. Smale, Brown, McFarlane, Gavin, Paul, Elder, Barry, to name but a few. The Hogsback, in geologic terms an esker, which is a gravelly ridge, runs through Elgin from the first concession through to the third and out to the Chattagay River on the Gilmore side road, where the old Monroe settlement was. The Hogsback was an easy, dry way to get from one end of Elgin to the other, and the Indians also used it often as they passed through on their hunting trips. Along the Hogsback, on the second concession, was the William Waddy homestead, settled in 1842. He purchased an additional 10 acres to the east, so he could use the spring water there to make whiskey following the old country tradition. This farm remained in the family until 1945 when one of Elgin's early French families, the Brunettes, bought it. By 1825, almost all the lots along the first concession had been claimed from Trout River to Oak Creek. One of these lots was claimed by John Donnelly and became known as Donnelly's Hill or Pigeon Hill as the sky was often filled with these birds. The David Andersons settled east of the Browns on the first concession and built the stone house still standing today, now owned by the great-granddaughter of Charles Crawford, Roberta Crawford Wimette. On Malcolm Hamilton's property stood a butter factory and a blacksmith shop. The southeast part of Elgin, along the first and the Shearer side road, was settled slowly due to its remoteness and the problem of getting the heavy timber out. It was settled by a group of families from New Monklands near Glasgow, Scotland. They had come up by blazed trails along the Chattagay River and their settlement became known as the King Settlement, as William King and his son, together with Alex Shearer and William Hay, were the first to settle this part of Elgin. Interestingly, none of them were farmers, which may explain their poor choice of this stony and heavily timbered land. Some of the early settlers along the third concession were George Elder, James Tully, William Stewart, Thomas Langtree, James Paul, 
and Robert and Alexander Smale. They came up along a bush track that followed the ridge separating the second and third concessions known as John Harper's Hill. James Paul, whose name graces the Paul side road, built his first shanty by mistake on the Lank Tree lot and had to remove and rebuild it on the right side of the property line. The prominent family names associated with the third concession is that of the Stewart family. William Stewart settled on the corner of the third concession and Gilmore Side Road in 1831, and the farm has remained in the family ever since. Across from the Stewart farm was the Stewart schoolhouse, Elgin School No. 5, and on the opposite corner there was a butter factory. The factory's seasonal workers as well as the school teacher, would board with the Stewart family on occasion. W.R. Stewart was the mayor of Elgin from 1921 through 1944 and a warden of the county. North of Elgin, where the hog's back runs out, settled slowly as the land flooded often, as it still does today, and was difficult to drain. The Glen Elm area and Gilmore Side Road were settled by William Hinkston, Captain Edwards, Thomas Stott, John and Hiram Seeley, John Anderson, Alexander McIntosh, and the Grant family, which still farms there today. Some of these farms were later taken over by yet more familiar names. Jack McKee, James Donnelly, Charlie Brown, Bill Dawson, Albert Gilmore, John and Albert Cairns, the Watson and McIntyre families, and Jim McFarlane. Much of the fourth concession, which runs parallel to the Trout River, was slow in settling as well. The land was very wet and bordered on one side by the clergy reserve and on the other by the crown reserve near the Kevin Grove area. A prominent family of the fourth concession was the McFarlands. 
All the McFarlands of Elgin were descended from this one family of 15 children. Daniel McFarland served as Elgin's first mayor from 1855 through 1862. Later, Daniel McFarland Jr. served as mayor from 1864 through 1886. The first French-Canadian family to move to Elgin was that of François Bergevin, and the farm is still owned by his great-grandson Roger, who served as a municipal councillor for almost 30 years. François was a pump maker and milked 40 cows. No small feat as all cows were milked by hand then. He was among the first to send milk by train to Châtaigny, New York, and Montreal. As there were no French schools in the area, the Bergevins went to the Stuart Schoolhouse down the road and then to the Protestant High School in Athelston. Other French-Canadian families that came to settle in Elgin were the Le Pierres, experienced stonemasons, the Brisoises, Taifires, Brunet, and Carrière. Over the years, many other nationalities have joined Elgin's ranks. Dutch, Swiss, Greek, Italian, Hungarian, Armenian, Austrian, German, and American, to name a few. Whether a new resident or a descendant of a founding family, Elgonites are proud of the history and heritage that is the legacy of hard work of those pioneering families who created the richness Elgonites enjoy today. There were many other occupations aside from farming that were necessary for the success of Elgin. The family's survival sometimes depended on their other talents. Potash was one major industry, but there were also weavers, seamstresses, carpenters, loggers, harness makers, wagon and sled builders, shoemakers, and blacksmiths. Elgin's second mayor, Joseph Scriver, erected the first sawmill on Oak Creek. The planks that were cut there were used to build ships and homes, or they were shipped to other parts of the country, creating income for the family. At Holbrook Bridge, sometimes called Watson's Bridge, in the Kensington area, there was a store, a blacksmith, and a customs house. Further along the Trout River, near the present-day customs, there was a sawmill, a carding mill, a separating mill, a tannery, and an ashery and purling works. The greatest need for the early settlers was a grist mill. In the first years, the only mills were in Valleyfield, Barrens and Huntington, in Fort Covington, New York, or in Constable, New York. It was no easy task getting a crop to the mill to be ground into flour. The roads were simple bush tracks upon which one would have to walk on foot with a sack of grain slung over one's back 
or with a horse through miles of often muddy and difficult terrain. In 1828, Alexander Henderson and Andrew Anderson erected the Kensington Mill on the east bank of the Trout River at the end of the second concession. The mill was first run by a Frenchman named Julien and later by Peter Taylor. In 1831, a huge flood took away part of the dam. Once repaired, a sawmill was built on the west bank of the river. A bridge was also constructed so that people from Elgin and Godmanchester could cross to either side. In 1835, Henderson bought out Anderson and became sole operator of the mill and in 1836, Robert Clark was hired as manager. For many years, grist was paid for in trade of potash, as this was the only currency the settlers had. In 1851, a new mill was built to replace the old one, and Clark continued to run the mill until his retirement in 1869. Several owners ran the mill succeeding Clark's departure. Samuel Lamb, Jonas Spencer, Francis Downey, Hugh Gavin, Big Dave McFarlane, Tom Hingston, Bill Fee, Bill Arthur, David and Maitland McCracken, Don McPherson, Ijar Holmes, and Marshall Hooker. The mills are presently owned by Tom and Larry Hooker, who for a time operated as a grist mill and then turned it into a foundry. The old mill that was built in 1831 and later rebuilt burned down in 1952 and was never replaced. The grist mill of 1851 was also destroyed by fire in 1956. In the spring of 1957, Marshall Hooker acquired the property and rebuilt the buildings which stand there today. Another necessity became the post office, of which Elgin had several. At Kelso, which opened in 1868 and was run by Dave McFarlane. At Glen Elm, where the train tracks crossed the third concession. At Beath, on the first concession and Wadi Side Road. And yet another at Kelvin Grove, at the corner of the Paul Side Road, and the fourth concession, run by Mrs. John Paul. The families who stayed behind in the old country wrote often to those who came to the new land. The post office became a gathering place where they could not only pick up the mail, but where they could get caught up in the news of the day. In those days, mail could simply be addressed as Elgin, Canada East, and it would be delivered to its destination.
Elgin's mail delivery history would not be complete without mentioning its two most famous mailmen. Albert M. Gilmore was mailman prior to 1936, but when he became ill that winter with pneumonia and was unable to continue, his stepson, James Henry Tallon, born November 21, 1918, took over. Jim stayed on as Elgin's mailman until his retirement 59 years later, on March 31, 1995. Mail was first delivered by horse and buggy in the summer months and by horse and cutter in the winter months. It wasn't until the 1940s that Jim could be seen delivering mail in his Model A Ford. In some cases, Jim delivered to four or five generations of the same household. Often, if someone could not make it to the store, he'd pick up the requested groceries and deliver them later with the mail. Jim had a soft spot for children. He was well known to have some candy or bubble gum in his pocket for the boys and girls he'd meet along his route. His service and dedication to the people of Elgin often went above and beyond the call of duty. Today, Elgin can boast many businesses and entrepreneurs. There still remain some fifth and sixth generation family dairy farms. There are sheep, pigs, beef, organic vegetables, conventional crops, a bakery, maple syrup producers, artisans and graphic artists, viniculture, carpenters and cabinet makers to name just a few. The first settlers were mainly God-fearing Presbyterian Scots. Before churches were built, people would take turns meeting at each other's houses to read from the family Bible. The traveling minister would perform marriages and baptisms as he passed through. Reverend Alex McWaddy from Georgetown, near Howick, was one of the first ministers to serve the families of Elgin. Although he would sometimes fall prey to drink and ceremonies would be postponed for a day or two while he slept it off, guests would wait patiently and the momentous occasion would eventually take place. In 1862, a search was being conducted for a minister to preach at the Stone Church at Kelso on a regular basis. Reverend J.S. Lockheed was hired to serve both Elgin and Athelston, and in 1864, a manse and stable were added near the church. In 1888, the manse burned down, but with their insurance policy, the thrifty Scots rebuilt the brick building we know today as Kelso Hall in 1890. The church served many families and functions over the years, such as picnics, marriages, funerals, and socials. In 
The school was another important institution for the settlers, so in 1828, a school and Sunday school had been established with a church soon after. In the beginning, a teacher would go door to door and gather several children in one home to teach for a period of time and then move on to another section of the municipality. This went on until Elgin decided that children should go to school on a regular basis and built the five original schoolhouses. The Holbrook School on the west end of the first concession, the Victoria School near the corner of the first and the Wadi side road, the Graham School at the corner of the first and the Shearer side road, the Eddy School on the corner of the third concession and the Smale side road, and the Stewart School on the corner of the third concession and the Gilmore side road. These schools remained in operation until the 1940s. Three still exist, but are used as private homes. Elgonites were buried in the cemetery across from the town hall on the second concession, and others were buried in Athelston. It has also been recorded that approximately 60 people are buried on the knoll on the east side of the Smale side road, though there are no stones left to verify this. Some pioneers were buried on their own property, like the small Rustin family plot on the third concession and Wadi side road. Major Hingston was buried at his place on the third, and was subsequently removed and reburied in Montreal. There is also the Macbeth Wadi Mausoleum on the second concession. With cemeteries come ghost stories. Jack McKee, who drove the milk cart to pick up milk cans for train shipment to Montreal, is a rumored third concession ghost. Although he tried to kill himself by ingesting rat poison, he apparently didn't find this method fast enough. He walked to McKee's hole, a deep spot in Mud Creek by the Twin Bridges, and drowned himself. In 1891, the railroad came to Elgin. The New York Central Railroad passed from northern New York through Elgin, connecting to the city of Montreal. The first train run was in July of 1892. Finally, Elgin was connected to the outside world. There were about six trains that passed through every day, stopping at the first station on this side of the border in Glen Elm on the third concession. Here, at the Customs House, passengers and luggage would be checked. Meanwhile, hungry travelers could grab a bite at a local farmer's place, and the store near the tracks became a busy place for shopping and serving refreshments.
The train made a dramatic change in the lives of Algonites. They could now send products and merchandise to larger markets and travel to the city. The station was so busy that a mile of sidewalk was added to accommodate the loading and offloading of goods and a stockyard and pens were built, all managed by about six employees. With the arrival of road vehicles and trucks, the train station gradually dwindled and the station was demolished in the mid-1950s. The last train, a Conrail, made its final journey in the spring of 1980. The War of 1812 had been over before most of the original settlers arrived here, but there were, unfortunately, many more battles to come in these new lands. of 1866 through 1870 were carried out by some Irish soldiers who had not long before fought in the civil war between the states. They used their training from that war to amass an army to retaliate against the British, of which Canada was still a colony, to convince Britain to relinquish control over their motherland, Ireland. The Fenians first planned to attack New Brunswick, but were stopped by the U.S. government. Another faction of Fenians made an attack on Fort Erie, Ontario, on June 1, 1866, and captured it. On June 3, 1866, the Canadian and British soldiers rebuffed the Fenians, driving them back across the border to Buffalo. On retreat, the Fenians made plans to raise more funds and munitions and attack Canada once again. It wasn't until 1870 that rumors started again of a Fenian attack on Canada, planned to take place along the Quebec border, more specifically along the Huntington frontier. The Canadian army began amassing its soldiers for the defense and local militias prepared to defend their family and homes. The 50th Battalion of Huntington Borderers was called to duty. On May 27, 1870, the Fenians, having amassed an army in Malone, New York, and along the border at Trout River, were ready to attack. The battle took place at the Holbrook Farm, just west of Trout River, at the end of the first concession, and across the river on the James Donnelly Farm now the Trout River Golf Course. The battle lasted only minutes as the Fenians were not prepared to face the onslaught of the borderers and British and Canadian troops intent on defending their newfound homes. Much later, another situation arose along the border. The U.S. enacted prohibition from 1920 to 1933, and there were many willing Canadians eager to supply, for profit of course, their dry neighbours to the south. At one point, there was a secret bar, which was known as a blind pig, in the woods on the Jameson Line Road, which leads up to the border.
During the first part of the new century, many of Elgin's young men went off to fight in both World War I and II. Many other young men, farmers, were sorely disappointed that they would not see action, but they were needed on the home front for the equally important job of growing and raising food to supply our brave troops. Over the years, these brave newcomers to a strange new land faced many hardships. In August 1831, a severe frost hit the valley, wiping out nearly all the crops. Many Elginites suffered from hunger that winter, as grain prices were very high, if even grain could be found to purchase. Throughout the 1830s, cholera epidemics were the cause of many deaths, in some cases wiping out entire families. In later years, smallpox was a leading cause of death among Elgin's families. In July 1996, a tornado swept through parts of Elgin, destroying several barns and a house, and wiping out whole sections of trees in its path. Many may still remember the 1961 ice storm, which broke down trees and knocked out power all over the southern part of the province similar to the ice storm of January 1998, still fresh in every Elgonite's memory. For weeks on end, people went without power, but once again the hardy and resourceful Elgonites came to each other's aid. difficulties and challenges over the years, fun and good times were never far from the hearts and souls of Elgonites. In early years, they would gather at each other's homes to play music and dance. Later, barn dances became all the rage. Baseball games, swimming, golf club parties, the Beagle Club, the Elgin Picnic, the Elgin Fife and Drum Band, and celebrating Elgin's 125th and 150th milestones were just some of the joyous celebrations. Many a young Elgin man and woman met their future Mr. and Mrs. at one of these functions. Elgin continues to be a much desired place to live. Its rich history, both past and present, full of historical fact and legend, has become the legacy of our founding fathers in this magnificent corner of the country. <laughs> <laughs>